This is the Chapel Real Estate Show, episode number four. Welcome to the Chapel Real Estate Show, your source for the latest real estate information so you can buy, sell, and invest with the best in Texas. Whether you're a first-time buyer, a current homeowner, or a seasoned investor, you've come to the right place. We're here to simplify all things real estate so you can achieve your goals of property ownership with your hosts, Daniel and Roger Chapel. Greetings, all of you wonderful people, and welcome to episode four of the Chapel Real Estate Show, where we discuss all things real estate so that you can buy, sell, and invest with the best with your hosts, Daniel and Roger Chapel. So, Dad, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, tonight we're going to be talking about rental properties and how you can best leverage your cash. Awesome. Well, I couldn't have said that better myself. So uh, today's topic is going to be really exciting, uh, namely what we're going to talk about in the last section of this episode, which is going to be how you can take advantage of the equity that you've built up in the properties that you own. So, uh, Dad, let's kind of jump into what has kind of your experience been with, uh, with rental properties over the years? Well, uh, back in 2007 or 8, uh, your mom and I wound up having to send a great big fat check to the IRS because we had paid off our, our primary home. We didn't own any other homes. It was just that one house. We paid it off, and we were no longer getting the tax deduction for the interest that we were paying on that home. So after I had to send that great big check to the government, I was furious. And your mom and I had already been talking about it for a couple of years before, and we just never jumped in to do it. For whatever reason, we were afraid to. Who knows? We just didn't do it until after that. That was the catalyst, and, uh, and we haven't looked back. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody has their kind of tipping point, right? So, I mean, I feel like that sending a big check to the IRS would be a good reason for you to kind of reassess how you can put your money to better use, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I was furious. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so how many rental properties have you owned over the years? Oh, man, that's a good question. I think probably four or five. Uh, right now, we currently own uh, four properties, uh, two of which are rentals. The other one uh, will likely be a rental by the end of this week. So, uh, we, and we've utilized a number of strategies to obtain these properties, and by no means are these low-end properties. These are all high-end properties that command uh, really good rental, uh, really good rent. So, uh, we're doing pretty well with them. Great, great. So, how would you say that those rental opportunities have kind of given you a little bit more opportunities as far as what you can do with your cash? Uh, it's crazy, the stuff that you learn doing this. Yeah. So... After we got over the fear and bought our first rental property, we decided to invest some initial money into it, and we realized at the time, since we paid off our primary home, we had a ton of equity in that house that was just sitting there. It's not doing anything. So your mom and I discussed it and decided, you know what, we're going we're to leverage that cash. So we took out a home equity loan, and at the time, I think we were only allowed to borrow up to 50% of the equity. Mm -hmm. So we borrowed it, and we did it in what's known as a HELOC which is a home equity line of credit loan. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, mm -hmm. we could write checks when we needed to. The, the caveat was there had to be a minimum of $4,000. Mm -hmm. So anytime we needed to borrow, we could, and then we would pay the interest off of that portion that we had, had borrowed from. Mm -hmm. So that allowed us to, number one, have the money to put down on another house. Okay. Number two, have the cash to be able to pay for the re renovations that we did on it, and then lease it out. Well, then we started getting additional money and all of that went back into paying the HELOC down. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, over a short period of time, we paid all of that off and owned our first property. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say that's definitely a, a great way to put your money to use. I mean, it sounds like you were able to take a property that you own to leverage it to purchase more property. And, I mean, that just, why wouldn't you do that, right? Right. I mean, initially we had 20% uh, equity in the home, so we didn't have to pay, pay PMI which is the uh, primary mortgage insurance, which, I mean, to be honest with you, if you can get out of paying that, it really does help you uh, uh, on your payments because now you're able to, if you keep the payment the same, you're allowed to put that extra $100, $200 towards your principal, which pays that down, and over time, you pay a lot less for that loan than you would have in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So, wow. <clears throat> um, so before we, we hop into the chapel chunk, what advice do you have for uh, – for a person who may be hesitant in becoming a landlord? Well, that's a tough one. Um, do your homework. Uh, 
and before you jump into this, I mean, anytime you're buying a house, uh, it's a serious decision. So you want to make sure that uh, you're working with professionals that can help guide you in the proper way uh, and listen to the advice from the professionals. Um, that's the biggest advice I can give that I think would be you know, the most beneficial right now. Okay, great. Well, for all of you people that are out there thinking about whether or not this is going to be the right move for you, take that advice. Uh, you know, as uh, I believe it was Warren Buffett who says, don't ever invest in anything that you don't understand. So make sure you do your due diligence, understand what we're getting into. And that's what we want to help you guys with today. So uh, that being said, let's get into the chapel chunk for the day. So, the chapel chunk for today is very simple. Take action. Stop thinking about it. Stop talking about it. Take some action. Awesome. Well, I think that's great. I mean, I don't even think we need to elaborate on that. Get to work, guys. Take action. <clears throat> so, moving into today's topic, uh, let's go ahead and get into the episode. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about rental property investing. Uh, what are some of the benefits of it? So, why should you invest in real estate? Let's, let's start there. So, um, the biggest reason, first and foremost, that you should be investing in real estate is that people are always going to need a place to live. If you're not owning a property on your own right now, chances are you're paying rent. So if you're paying rent, why would you not want somebody else to pay your mortgage for you instead of you paying someone else's mortgage? So um, you know that's, that's really the first thing is you should be investing in real estate because it's going to be forgiving over time because everybody's going to need a place to live. So you know, what, what do you think about that? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Excuse me. No, that, that's absolutely true. Um, and, you know, the other thing I get to thinking about, too, is that paying rent, to me, rent is a four-letter word. I will not pay rent. I, I just can't do it. It's not in my DNA. But I'll collect rent every month. Yeah. On the first of the month, I collect it. And I have been collecting it for a very long time, on the first of every month. So, I mean, with that said, it, it kind of... Let's put it this way. I have extra money every month. It's passive income. I don't have to do anything for it. I've already done all the work. And it continues to pay me every single month. Yeah. That's pretty good. I mean, it is. To, to be able to make your money go to work for you instead of having to physically go to work for money, I think that that is a very significant distinction when you talk about investing in real estate. Well, one of the greatest things for me is that um, at, at my age and your mom's age, we're able now for your mom, <coughs> excuse me, to not have to work anymore. Now she can hang around the house if she wants, or she can go volunteer if she wants. We no longer have to rely on her income. Our income is already set with our passive investments where, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, now it's, it's true income. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> early retirement, I'm telling you, it's a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet. So, uh, you know, let's talk about some of the tax benefits that you get. So we kind of mm -hmm. touched on this uh, a minute ago, but that is another big, big uh, benefit to investing in real estate is all the different tax benefits. So why don't you touch on some of the major, I guess, current uh, benefits that you get if you own real estate? So I want to preface this by I am not a CPA, I'm not a tax accountant, I'm not a tax attorney, and I'm not offering tax advice. So I want to make sure I get that out there right now. Yeah. Now, with that said, I know what I have been able to deduct, and I know what I've been able to help other people with in, in their uh, uh, rental investments. So, first of all, there's one thing that's called the 1031 exchange. Currently, that is still uh, permissible. Mm -hmm. So, it's a way to defer paying any kind of capital gains taxes on any real estate property that one owns. What happens is, you own a piece of real estate, and it a, it's a, has to be an investment income property, first of all. So if one owns that, then you can take that and turn around and sell it. And then you have a certain period of time to be able to identify additional property and then close on that property. So you have to identify a new property within 45 days. Within 180 days, you have to close on the second property. Now, the caveat on that is the second property has to be valued at more than the property one sold. So if I sold a house for 300000 the next property that I purchase has to be more than 300000 mm -hmm. period. And only have 180 days from the date of closing on that property to close on the second property. So that way that money kind of sits out there and it waits. So in a way, once that first property is paid off, you can turn around and pay cash for a second property. Or you can take out a loan with it. So that's a question for uh, the bank or your mortgage company mm -hmm. uh, as to whether or not and how that's all going to work. There's also a 1031 uh, exchange coordinator 
that can help walk uh, the investor through some of those problems, or some of those uh, hurdles that you might come across. Mm -hmm. uh, the second way is, of course, uh, your, your uh, interest off of your, your homes. So you're able to deduct a portion of that from your income. So that helps knock you down a bracket or two. And again, I'm not the tax person, so I just know that I'm able to claim a lot more exemptions uh, by doing that. So for me, I own two rental properties in Houston and one in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So every time I make a trip to either of those places and I visit those homes, then I'm able to not only deduct the mileage, but the mill meals because of it's, it's a trip. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can also deduct, uh, like on, a lot of times when we're traveling and doing different things, your mom and I will actually go and look at properties. And we're looking for investment properties for the potential of purchasing them at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. So now I can write that trip off as well. And because it's a trip, it's not just a meeting or any other things. There's, there's other ways where we can make more tax deductions that way. Yeah. Finally, any kind of repairs that one does on their rental property are tax deductible. So that's, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. So. Uh, if the, the sink gets clogged and you got to send a plumber out to, to fix that or the sewage gets backed up, all those kind of things are tax deductible. So uh, that's, that's another positive thing. And then finally, and I, I don't know how to set this up, but I do know that it happens, where investors will either purchase property through a trust or through an LLC that they create. Uh, that also protects them liably, mm -hmm. uh, liability-wise. Uh, I don't understand all the ins and outs of all that, but I do know that that can occur. Okay, good, good. Well, uh, you know, something else that I kind of want to mention about the, the tax law, and I'm going to throw a little bit of credit out here to, uh, to the Rich Dad Company with their book, Tax-Free Wealth. But uh, I touched into that book here in the last year, and it really opened my eyes as to like some of the benefits that, that you can get from real estate, not just real estate investing, but just in general. So out of that entire tax code, actually only 1% of that tax code is written and designed to make you pay taxes. The other 99%, those you know, thousands of pages are all designed to save you money on your taxes, offer you different exemptions and things of that nature. So um, you know, owning real estate is one way to be able to take advantage of a lot of those tax deductions. But um, if you've got some time and you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, check out that book. It is a great read if you're looking at uh, doing any type of investing in the future. So, What's um, the name of that book again? Tax-Free Wealth uh, by Robert Kiyosaki. And uh, there's a co-author whose name escapes me right now. But a uh, really, really good book. Definitely recommend that one. Maybe um, we need to find a way to tag that at the end of our... You know what? Yeah, check the show notes and we'll, we'll have that in the show notes for you guys. Um, so now let's go ahead and move into, you know, now we know what some of the benefits are of investing in real estate. So what is, you know, what does it take to get started? So, um, you know, we've kind of come up with a three-step process to getting started. Uh, and that's going to be number one is going to be to recognize. Number two is going to be to strategize. And number three is going to be to monetize. So, Dad, why don't you uh, explain to us for a second, what do we mean by recognize when we're talking about this? So recognize is actually a multifaceted process. So uh, you recognize uh, what, what it's going to take you uh, to invest in real estate to begin with. So uh, that's going to require some financial knowledge. Uh, you need to know how much money you're going to be able to put down and uh, which financial institution you're going to use to kind of help you through that. And there's a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any questions about that, please reach out to us. We can connect you with all the right folks. That includes hard money lenders, uh, banks, mortgages, whatever. We can put you in touch with some folks that can help you better understand the best strategy for you because that's important. It's your money, it's your strategy, and you need to, to recognize what that is. Uh, so uh, you need to analyze and identify some properties. So uh, we here at the Chapel Realty Group, we already do that for our investors. So all we need you to do is locate the property, tell me what the property address is, um, and then we'll try to take a look at it if we can. Sometimes it's out of state, we can't. But we'll, we'll include uh, a potential budget for renovation if that's necessary. Uh, and we can uh, let you know whether or not that property is going to appreciate, not necessarily appreciate, but whether or not it's going to uh, generate the rental income that you expect. Mm -hmm. uh, or what it could, what the potential is for. Because, you know, whatever it is today, it may be listed or, or marked well below true market value because it's uh, deferred maintenance problems. Could so, be deferred maintenance problems, could be great tenant that's been in there for five, ten years and they don't yeah. want to jack the rates up. So there's a lot of reasons why properties may not be renting for their full market value. Um, but that is why we analyze the properties. We want to make sure that as an investor, you're protected and that you're making an investment that's going to pay you in the future. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's extremely important. One other part of the recognition has to do with uh, understanding the cost of owning a rental property. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as a person who, who has leased before, I mean, what happened if the sink broke down for you? I got to call my, my maintenance guy, and usually within 24 hours or so, they'd have somebody out to fix it. Okay, so what happens when you're the landlord? You're the fixer. You're the fixer. <laughs> so I know for me, uh, on most of my properties, I have a home warranty. So I have the tenant contact the home warranty company to have those issues resolved. Uh, if it's something that's outside the scope, uh, then I would uh, make sure I contacted one of our contractors that's there locally. Uh, and we have contractors in, in every place where I have a house. So uh, I don't have to pay somebody else to manage it. I still manage these properties. Or, not your mom and I manage them ourselves. So, uh, and that's another thing, property management. Maybe you do want to hire a property manager to manage that property. And that's part of your, actually that's part of the strategy. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll touch on that here in just a second. Um, so was there anything else you, you wanted to touch on for recognize? Not right now. Yeah, I think you pretty much hit it all. So that's step one is recognizing what it takes to, to invest in real estate. Number two is going to be strategizing. So um, strategizing is going to be all about establishing what your rental criteria are going to be. So are you looking to make a single family investment, multifamily? Do you prefer condos or townhomes? Are you maybe looking at doing a commercial kind of investment? Maybe you want to do office condominiums or, um, or you know, he's wearing a Smoothie King shirt right now. Maybe you want to have tenants like that. Uh, you know, there's also long and short term rentals, there's house hacking. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get into it. So, you know, look at your, your own personal situation. What are, what are your goals? Are you looking to, you know, uh, house hack and, and save on your mortgage, but live close to your work? If that's the case, then you need to make sure you're looking, you know, geographically near your, your work location. Maybe you only have 10 or $15,000 that you want to play with. So now you're, you're looking at a budget. You're a little bit more budget conscious. So look in areas that are going to be able uh, that you're going to be able to make your money or maximize your money rather. Um, so, you know, that's part of the strategize. And then number three is going to be to monetize. So um, I'm going to kind of introduce the five steps to monetization and then I'll kind of hand it over to uh, Roger here to kind of explain what we mean by that. But uh, so monetization, we have five steps. Number one is going to be to locate. Number two, negotiate. Three, renovate. Number four, dictate, and number five, our favorite, celebrate. So uh, let's let's dive into that. So what do we mean by locate when we're talking about monetization? Well, you just talked a, a briefly about that, but uh, you, there's some things that have to get factored in when you're trying to figure this kind of scenario out. So uh, let's assume you now have a neighborhood that you've identified as one that, uh, and I'm going to use you as, a, uh, as an example. You found one neighborhood that, hey, this is a great neighborhood I'd like to invest in. So then you've driven around and you've located a couple of houses that you wouldn't mind. It looks kind of like there's deferred maintenance going on. Mm -hmm. So this is the strategy that you put together. You want to look for an old beat-up house that's not on the market. This is called off-market uh, prospecting, off-market searching. So a, a real estate agent can find some deals for you, but sometimes you're better off driving for dollars and just doing it yourself. So that's really what this is. So this is the strategy you, you put together in my scenario. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you've located a, a couple places and now you reach out to your favorite real estate agent and I turn around and I start doing the research on the properties and I have found, lo and behold, that uh, there's uh, an, uh, let's see, what's that called? Well, it's owned by somebody that doesn't live there. So, now I reach out to Joe Smith and say, hey, uh, I've got a, a client who's interested in purchasing your property, are you interested in selling? Lo and behold, Mr. Smith says he is. And we're able to, to work out a deal. That's just one of many, many strategies. Um, did I touch on locate? I mean, there, there's so many ways. Like looking through MLS, for example, um, maybe I can find a three bedroom, two bath uh, type of home that would fit some of your criteria. Or maybe just reaching out to other agents that I know. Hey, do you have something that's uh, not quite on MLS yet that you're interested in? Or do you got any properties that are owned by investors? They're discussing the possibility of selling. I may have a buyer for you. So there's a number of different strategies in order to locate a specific property uh, that might be something you can move on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and a great point. So, I mean, the biggest thing is going to be to locate something that's going to fit your needs. So, again, that kind of touches back on what I said a moment ago. What are, what are your goals with your investment property? Are you going to be living in it? Are you going to be renting it out? Um, you know, what, what is your goals with the property? And then that will help you drive, you know, that location. Um, so step two is going to be to negotiate. So you talked about how, all right, I've, 
I've now presented my, my couple of properties that I think would be good options to you. So now what are we going to do? So the best negotiation actually comes from, uh, I mean, if you're using a real estate agent, that's who's going to be negotiating that deal for you. If you're going to try to do it yourself, um, I mean, I really caution people about doing that. Unless you really understand what the contracts are all about and all the different strategies and, and whatnot that goes into those, uh, I wouldn't negotiate that yourself. I would hire a, or work with a, uh, an agent that can walk you through all of those steps and let them negotiate for you. Now, I will tell you that in today's market here near the Austin, Texas area, uh, there's no deals to be found. Deals are not out there right now. We have such a very strong seller's market. We have no inventory. So even investors are having a very hard time trying to find something to invest in. So now we're shifting our strategies. We're having to literally look outside of the Austin area, like well outside of the Austin area. We're talking 40, 45 minutes out to be able to find some of these properties. So now I found myself really searching, even on different MLS boards, to be able to try to locate some of these properties. It, they're just very few and far between right now. Yeah. Now, with that said, once COVID wraps up, you know, because right now everybody's, uh, the foreclosures and things like that keep getting pushed off, and rightfully so. I'm not uh, yes or no about any of that. The bottom line is those are being pushed off, and at some point, all that's going to catch up, and then we're going to have some more distressed properties mm -hmm. at the market. And distressed properties are a really good way to take advantage uh, if you're an investor and you've got the, the cash together where you can do that. Uh, but that's just one of many strategies to use. Uh, it's not the one that I would rely on 100%, but... It is one one strategy. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so uh, now we've negotiated the terms of the property. We've, you know, submitted some offers, um, and hopefully, you know, maybe maybe not in the Austin area, but maybe just outside, we were able to get something under contract. So um, now we've got it under contract. We've gotten it closed. It's my property now. So our next step is going to be to renovate. So why would we renovate? Well, sometimes you may not need to. So if you buy a property that's like that, you may need to do a little tweaking here and there. Uh, maybe you repair the AC or something along those lines, maybe some minor repairs. Okay, fine. But if you want to maximize your rent, then you really do need to, uh, you may need to do some renovations. So I remember the first property that uh, your mom and I bought, it was a small house, 1,100 square feet, uh, two bedroom with a garage. But it was a one car garage. And out in that neighborhood, it had a carport. Now in that neighborhood, I thought, well, this is kind of ridiculous. I mean, you can't park two cars in here, so why even have it? It's converted to a bedroom. So we did. We converted that garage into a bedroom, and then uh, we put hardwood flooring in there. The rest of the house had hardwood flooring, and uh, we were able to lease it out. It took us several months because we were doing this ourselves. So we did hire a contractor to help us with a lot of the stuff, but you know, some of the uh, mom and I did all the painting. We did uh, quite a bit of like baseboards and some of the trim and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, we did the floors. Uh, we actually hired somebody to actually install the floors, and we finished them. Uh, but then. Uh, you know, adding like being able to close up the side of a house where a garage door was. I don't have the foggiest idea how to do that. Yeah. No clue. So we hired uh, a gentleman and his wife. Uh, and it turns out it was a family business. Uh, and they came out and they did all this for us. So, but, but it took us a while because we had to pay as we went. Right. So we didn't have the cash to jump in and all at once. But over about uh, four to five months, we were able to get it done. And then we leased it out. And we've had a tenant living in there ever since. Yeah. And on that particular property, we've watched, I think we've paid 150000 for it. And in 10 years, well, now it's been almost 12 now, I think, or 13. Anyway, but, but within 10 years, that property more than doubled in value, just mm -hmm. the dirt. Because the house is going to be torn down. The house right next to it is a million-dollar house. Yeah. So they're tearing down all these old little houses that were built in the 40s and building these great big monstrous things in there. So and selling them for a very nice chunk of change. So we're sitting on a little gold mine. That's not the only one. We have another one just a couple of miles from there that we're doing the exact same thing with. So, I mean, if you find the right home in the right neighborhood and you renovate it, you do the right renovations. That's the other thing. There's a lot of folks that will come in on those house flippers, and not all of them, but there are many of them that will come in and they do what I call put lipstick on a pig. Yep. You put lipstick on a pig, you get what you pay for. So if you're going to just go out there and, and do the cheap stuff, then you're going to get cheap rent. Yeah. And not only that, you're going to see that your maintenance issues are going to occur much more frequently. Mm -hmm. Here's a perfect example. Let's assume now that you want to replace the kitchen faucet or one of the bathroom faucets, and you buy the you know, $50 faucet. Okay, great. 
You saved yourself some money. But then six months from now, you're having to replace it again. And maybe four months after that, you're having to replace it again. So by that time, you're already into it for 150 bucks. Maybe more because the prices go up. Mm -hmm. Why not just pay 250 bucks and get yourself the really good one? Because guess what? Now you've got something that's solid. It's mostly metal. It's not all these plastic parts in it. And it's going to last you a lot longer. The other thing, too, is that think about long term. If you really want to maximize your rent, then you really do need to uh, do the right thing. Put the right kind of paint in there. Do the right stuff with the flooring. If you see problems behind the wall, rip the wall out. Fix it. Do the Fix right it kind of right. renovations. Yeah. yeah. If you do it right and you put it all back together again, then you're going to have a much longer lasting product with a lot fewer maintenance issues. Now, over time, some of that stuff is going to happen. I remember one of our homes, the uh, one of the sewage lines busted or something, and they wound up costing me a ton of money to get that fixed. But you know what? That's one of those things you couldn't plan for. Yeah. We never saw anything. There was no indication was something was wrong until all of a sudden it was wrong. Yeah. So. Well, I kind of want to touch back on, you know, again, the faucets and the higher end finishes and stuff. Not only is that going to help you as far as the maintenance is concerned and not having to make replacements on things like that, but. You get more rent. Yeah. You, it commands more rent. You know, you, you have these higher end finishes, you get higher end tenants. So. Um, that's another big thing to consider is, you know, having those little higher finishes. The, the type right. of people that look for those kind of finishes are going to be the type of people that want to rent there. Right. And then most of the time, and this is not exclusive, but most of the time those folks uh, take really good care of the property. If mm -hmm. something comes up, they'll notify us right away. Uh, whereas if you have a, a property that hasn't been very well maintained, then the tenants figure, well, shoot, why should I care? The owner doesn't care. Yep. As the faucet starts to spray a little right. wonky, they're like, eh, whatever. The other one in the other bathroom is doing it too. Right. So why bother? Why should I mention it? Right. So, I mean, and they won't. So then, you know, whenever they leave, and they could be long-term tenants, they're just content. It's, I mean, they're fine with it. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. I would much rather have the right thing in there. And then when it goes wrong, I know they're going to call me and I can get the proper repair done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, now we've gone through renovations. The next thing is going to be to dictate the terms of the lease, right? So we've already, you know, we've been through, we've located the property, we've purchased it, we've renovated it. Now it's ready to get put on the market. Um, speaking of when you're renovating, you want to make sure that you kind of stick to a tight time frame, right? Because yep. every month that you're in that house and you're paying a mortgage payment, that's more money that you're putting into that investment, more money that you are looking to make back from it in the future. So, um, you know, try to get that renovation done as quickly as possible. But now that it's done, and we've got it listed on the market. Um, you know, we got to dictate the terms of the lease. So, um, what are some standard things that you typically, as a landlord, would make sure that are that are incorporated in your leases? Well, there's a number of things. So, uh, because I'm a licensed agent, then uh, same with you. Then we have access to uh, the uh, Texas this, Realtors forms. Is that well, right? Exactly. Yeah, the TXR form. Uh, we have access to those forms, which are very specific and. Uh, they're pretty good. So some of the things that I look for is I want the tenant to pay all the bills. I'm not paying water. I'm not paying electricity. I'm not paying any of the bills. To me, the tenant lives there. Uh, they're utilizing those utilities. They can pay for those utilities. Additionally, I do want them to maintain my yard, and I want them to water the yard. Water in the yard is not just about keeping the grass green. It's also about the foundation, and it's more about the foundation than anything else. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is if you don't water your yard or your foundation, you don't maintain it, then you're asking for trouble later on. Trust me on this. You have to do that. So uh, that's very important. Uh, the other thing, too, is yard maintenance. Um, sometimes I'll include that in the rent. It depends on how much rent they're paying me. Uh, but most of the time, I'll leave that up to the tenant as well. I think it's more important that, that they, they assume that role. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, uh, you have to be very specific about that, too. So I remember one uh, issue I had with a tenant. Uh, she wanted us to treat for ants, and I'm like, I'm not treating for ants, I'm maintaining the yard. Well, when I got back and I started reading the um, uh, lease agreement in more detail, well, yard maintenance did indeed include taking care of, of uh, bugs on the outside. So mm -hmm. uh, I went ahead and, and took care of that for her, and I'm glad she pointed that out to me because mm -hmm. that was something that, I mean, it was an oversight on my part. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, Always resort back to that, that lease agreement. There's a lot of information in there. Pets, pets are a big deal. Uh, you know, we're, we're dog people here. Oh, yeah, big time. But on one of my properties, I don't want pets in that house. And the reason being is that we already had an issue before on wood floors with having dogs in the house, and they tore up the wood flooring, and then I had to have the floors refinished. 
Well, you can only refinish the floors you know, two or three times before that's it. Now you have to replace the floors. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really want to get into that again. So uh, now on at least one of the properties, they're not allowed to have animals. Uh, but then uh, some of the others will do that. But th those are the kind of details that go into the uh, lease agreement itself. Right. And if the, the prospective tenant comes with an agent, you're going to go over all these terms with the other agent uh, as well so that there's a clear understanding of what the tenant is to expect. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that brings us into step five, which is celebrating, guys. You did it. So now that uh, you've gotten everything taken care of, you've located your property, you've negotiated your terms, you've renovated it, you've dictated your, your lease terms, you've got a tenant in there, now it's time to celebrate because guess what? Your money is working for you. You've moved your money from your savings account and put it into an investment property that's now going to pay you in the future. Your tenant's going to take care of that mortgage payment for you. They're going to take pay down that principal balance every month. In addition, you're bringing home a couple hundred bucks a month because your rent and or rather your mortgage is paid for and you're collecting a little bit extra from your rent payments. And then your property is going to appreciate over the next few years. So, um, you know, all of that, you've got your work, your money working for you threefold, um, which is fantastic. But now what? Right. Yeah. Now we've got all this all this equity built up in all these properties or property. And now what can I do with it? So let's discuss some of the strategies that you can use to pull out some of that equity that you've used or that you've gained and leverage it for other investments. So one of the things that uh, your mom and I did a couple of years ago is uh, one of the properties I was just mentioning about in Houston, we owned it outright. <clears throat> so we also knew that the value on that property had gone up quite a bit. And now the law has changed to where we can actually borrow more against that home than uh, what we could in the past. It used to be as 50%. Uh, on your primary home mm -hmm. in, in Texas. So the law changed to where now it's 80% on your primary home and 75% on a um, an investment property. Or maybe it's 70%. Whatever it is, it's much higher than 50%. Mm -hmm. So your mom and I got to looking at it, and of course your brother uh, was looking at purchasing a, a franchise of his own, and we had been discussing with him for a long time about how all this was going to happen, and he bought a Smoothie King. <laughs> In Houston, at the corner of uh, West New York and, and Fry Road. Fry Road. So of Fry. any of our Houstonites out there, Houstonians, you'll definitely want to go out there and check it out. Yep, get the plug in for Smoothie King. <laughs> so, uh, but we were because we own had so much equity in that home, we were able to take that equity and leverage it uh, to help purchase and uh, invest in the Smoothie King. And I gotta say, even through COVID, I've been quite surprised at how well that business has, has done. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just tremendous. So, uh, I mean, it's a way for us to uh, divest, uh, no, not divest, diversify, diversify <laughs> our, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> fake cases. But a great way to diversify our investments. So now we don't own just those rental properties. Now we also have part ownership in uh, a franchise, yeah. something I never imagined that I would do. And something that your mom and I are extremely happy and proud to be able to help uh, your brother with. So yeah. So I mean, you know, that's just one of the many things that you can do when you've built equity in a property, right? That's I mean, that gave you some really tremendous options. So that's yeah. phenomenal. Um, so some other things that you can do, you know, uh, one of the most common investing strategies that's used um, by most investors is the Burr strategy, which is B R R R R. I think that's right. Uh, and what that stands for is buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. So in the scenario that we presented you guys with earlier in the episode, we talked about the buying process, the rehabilitation process, and the rental process. So now the final two R's are rent and re I'm sorry, refinance and repeat. Um, so basically what you do at this point is, like he mentioned, the, there's, there's different ways that you can pull equity out of your home. There's home equity lines of credit. There's cash out refinances. Um, and these things allow you to pull out a certain amount of the equity that you have within the home so that you can use it to leverage to purchase another investment property, which is what's most common when you do the Burr method. Um, the other thing you can do is if, you know, whatever your financial position may be, maybe you want to leverage it for another investment, or maybe you want to make some renovations on your personal property. Maybe you want to go on a really beautiful vacation with your family, or you've got some credit cards that you need to pay off, whatever it may be. Um, you know, it's very versatile because you've built up this equity in the property. So um, a common misconception that I've heard a lot of people talk about is, you know, real estate's not very liquid. Once my money's in there, how am I supposed to get it out? Um, well, these are some of the things that you can do. And as you know, 
as Roger's living testament to, there's a lot of options that you have once you have a good amount of equity built up in not just one, but two, three, or four or five uh, investment and and uh, and personal properties. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the other thing is, you know, once you know he's mentioned to this as well, paying off the property, right? Once the property is actually paid off, um, then you can maximize your rental profits. You can take the money and the equity that you have out of it. Um, put a new mortgage payment on there that's a little bit lower, still maximize your profits, use that money to invest in other things. Um, and then the other option is, or the current option that's available to us is selling and using the 1031 exchange to move into bigger uh, and more profitable real estate investments like more you know, large commercial investments, apartment complexes, condo conversions, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, there's, there's tons of options, guys. I think that kind of wraps up everything that we've, we've had planned for the episode. Do you have anything else that you want to touch on? No, I think that, uh, that covered quite a bit of it. Covered quite a bit. So, um, guys, we're going to bring a lot more information to you guys about investing in the future. Um, to, to be able to fit it all into one episode would just be impossible. But we want to thank you guys again for your time and joining us on the Chapel Real Estate Show. And we will catch you guys on our next episode next week. We hope you guys have a great week, and we'll see you soon. See ya. Thank you for joining us this week on the Chapel Real Estate Show. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and leave us a review. Find us on social media at Chapel Realty Group and online at chapelrealtygroup.com. Until next time.